Welcome to Creekside Online. Our mission is to reach the world with Jesus one person at a time with Christ, community, and compassion. We are so glad that you're joining us today. If it was your very first time, please take a moment to click the link below and fill out the online connect card. We would love for you to stay connected throughout the week and everywhere you go. And the best way to do that is through our church app. There you can watch additional messages and find resources to help you grow in our relationship with Jesus Christ. It's free and you can download it wherever you download your apps. For us, church is much more than just a weekend experience. And we want you to know that there's a place perfect for you at Creekside. No matter where you're watching today, let's get ready for what God has in store for us. Good morning, church. I'm super pumped that I get to be over here hanging out with you guys this week and share a little bit of my heart with you all. We're continuing in this series called Heart Healthy that we've been in as a church for over a month now. It's been super good. It's been a great chance for us to see what it looks like that our hearts need to be in a spot to love and follow Jesus. It's been great for both Jesus followers and unbelievers alike, right? This series has been awesome for Jesus followers as a kind of check yourself type situation, right? Where you're like, all right, where do I need to be in following Jesus? How do I need to live my life? Am I doing these things? Then for unbelievers, it's been awesome to say, this is where I need to be going. And my desire to know Jesus, this is where I'm trying to land. This is what I'm looking towards as I get closer to Jesus. This is where my heart needs to be at. And as we continue this series today, I'm going to talk about this word treasure. This word treasure is where we're hitting today. And I want to do something a little bit differently than we normally do here. I want to begin with the ending. You guys cool with that? We're going to begin with the end. So I want to tell you about this guy I know. His name's Jesus. Some of you may have heard of him before. We have this piece of scripture, this Bible, and all the way through, we see Jesus through it all. Uh, if you don't know how that works, I'll give you a little tidbit really quick. So if you take your Bible, a physical Bible, and you open it, cut it in half, and then you take that back half and cut it in half again, you're either going to end up in one of these things called the Gospels, or maybe a few pages from it, but you'll be near the Gospels, which tells us that three quarters of the Bible, everything in front of that, is what's called the Old Testament. The Old Testament is all before Jesus walked the earth. This is all before Jesus was there. And then we hit these few pages in a row of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Like I said, these are what's called the Gospels, okay? And Jesus is living in this time. He's walking, doing his thing. Everything after those Gospels is after Jesus is crucified and raised from the dead and then ascends up to heaven. Everything after the Gospels is post-Jesus being here on earth. So running through that again, Old Testament, uh, we see Jesus here as Jesus is Jesus before he was even Jesus. Makes sense you guys got that, right? He, he's Jesus. We see that through prophecy and telling of what is to come and what Jesus is going to look like and how that's going to go. And then we see the Gospels where Jesus is seen extremely clearly because he's literally walking with the people, right? He's, he's on mission. He's doing ministry. See him super clearly there. Everything after that, we see Jesus through the lives of people figuring out how do we live as Jesus followers now that he's not here anymore. How do we do this thing? How does the early church start is how we see that. And then as we near the second cover, as scripture begins to come to a close, we hit this book called Revelation. And Revelation, just so you know, everything before Revelation is in the past from where we're standing today. And then Revelation is our look to the future. It, it tells of the end times and how things are going to go. And without getting too far into the depth of Revelation and kind of what that looks like, what we need to know is that Jesus wins. Right? In Revelation, Jesus wins. He comes back and defeats sin once and for all. He puts an end to Satan. Jesus wins. It's, it's stated extremely clearly in here. For all of us to see, it's in the scripture. We can all see it. It's right in front of us, but for some reason we find a way to mess this thing up, right? In fact, we flip from Jude to Revelation, the second to last book to the last, and we flip, as we flip this page, we flip so carelessly over this unknown period of time full of human growth and, and evolution and learning. We flip over our own lives as we flip this page. The way Jude finishes, it's like one last piece of like good old challenge and encouragement. It's like, hey, remember, go tell everybody about Jesus. 
Like, don't forget your job. Yet we so carelessly just flip the page. We're like, oh, that revelation thing sounds fun. That, that future stuff that I can learn about, I want to go do that. That sounds interesting. And we forget everything that happened before. We so carelessly flip over, again, the growth and the learning and, and all this good. But as we flip that page, we're also flipping over years of war, of economic hardships, racial divide. Right? We flip over so much hurt and heartache and sadness Yet we flip the page and we miss it all. It almost seems as if there should just be a page printed in between the two, like a bonus page in the Bible with big, bold letters, something along the lines of like, hey, don't miss what's happening right in front of you. Or even maybe just as blatantly clear as don't mess this up. Right? But what did we do? Found a way to mess it up. We think that for some reason, since we know Jesus wins, that we can just do whatever we want, live how we wish, and kind of disregard this last warning challenge that we see at the end of Jude. We messed it up. Which leads us right to where we're hanging out today. If you want to follow along, we're going to be in Luke chapter 18, starting in verse 18. It says, A certain ruler asked him, talking to Jesus, Good teacher, What must I do to inherit eternal life? Why do you call me good, Jesus answered. No one is good except God alone. He goes on to say, you know the commandments. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not murder. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony and honor your father and mother. All these I've kept since I was a boy is his response. Right, so we hit this spot, and this guy comes to Jesus, and he's like, hey, Jesus, I've heard you talk of this thing, eternal life. That sounds cool. Like, I'm interested. What do I need to do? And Jesus rattles off this list of things, and as re- Jesus is, is saying these things, the guy's like, oh, yeah, I'm, I'm in the clear. I'm sitting pretty. Like, that one I did a long time ago. That one's been done. That one I've had done since I was a child. Right? He thinks he's sitting pretty. He thinks this is nice and easy. But then the text continues. Right? Jesus goes on to say, You still lack one thing. Sell everything you have and give to the poor. And you will have treasure in heaven. And then come, follow me. When he heard this, he became very sad because he was very wealthy. So again, Jesus gives him this list, and he's like, cool, check, 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 got it, I'm clear there. And then Jesus is like, okay, but there's still one more. Sell all your stuff. Sell it all and follow me. Right, and this guy is broken down. It says he's sad. But, but the, the, the issue with this guy is not the fact that he's wealthy, That's not the problem. That's not the real problem. The real problem is not that he's a ruler and he's climbed the political ranks. Those aren't the real problems here. The problem that Jesus is getting at is that this guy lets these things consume him. His money, his power is where his sense of status comes from. Right? And what makes him so sad on the inside is that he cares more about what people think and carrying this level of status and finding his worth in these things than actually following Jesus, right? He finds his worth in these things, and they're more important to him than actually following Jesus. And I think this serves as one of those, like, hindsight's always 20-20 moments, right? Like, it's easy for us to look at this guy and be like, dude, like, take the deal, (laughs) right? Like, give it up, donate it to the people, do whatever it takes, like, just follow Jesus. It's easy for us to sit in our seat saying that, we might even be like, dude, you're going to be a sermon illustration for the rest of eternity. Like, (laughs) tighten up. Follow Jesus. That's easy for us to say. But what we have to remember is he's giving up more than just dollar bills, right? He's giving up his status, his, his treasure, what defines him. Which at this point, for ourselves, we have to take a little bit of a step back And check what that thing is for us. Right? Because you see, at the time that this story is taking place, people find their status and their worth in two things primarily, their their wealth and their power. And I think those still reign a little bit true 
today. We, some of us may define ourselves in getting a promotion, that we, we now make more money or now we're climbing the ladder. Right? We, we're, we're higher up in our business now. But as time has gone on from this passage, our, our world has created a place where just more and more and more and more and more things stack up and define us. Right? We've created this spot where more things define us. For some of us, we might find our sense of status in the way that we think we, as an individual, influence our family and set up our family. You know what I'm talking about? When we, when we work so hard and do so much to make sure our kid can go to that private school or play for that travel team or we can go on that vacation, even if that means I have to work a little bit of overtime and neglect them in the process. I think some of us find our sense of worth and our, and our status comes from, again, the way that we as an individual influence others. We find our sense of status and worth in knowing that someone picked up a particular trait because of something we taught them. or They gained this piece of wisdom from watching us. We find our sense of status in our sphere of influence And one that I think is especially true as of late is we find our sense of status in our calendars, in our schedules. I know I would fall into this category. I love for my calendar to be full. I I have mine color-coded. I want it all full. I want everything in there. And if I have gaps, I feel like I'm doing something wrong. This calendar schedule thing has taken over our world so much that we wear these two looks on our faces that are used more as badges of honor, probably, than than cries for help that they should be. These two looks are, number one, we see it on people's faces all the time. I'm just flat out exhausted. Right, and look number two is, hey, don't bother me right now, because I have somewhere to be in, oh, 57 seconds, so get out my way. Right, we see these two looks all the time. Some of us may have even seen them this morning, We see them all the time, and despite them being two completely different looks on someone's face, they give off the same message that, hey, my calendar is filled to the absolute brim, and I want you to notice me and respect me for it. Right? Whatever that thing is for you, that's exactly what Jesus is saying in that text. Whatever it is for you, set it aside and fix your attention on me. And my favorite part of Jesus' answer to this guy is that it's a two-part answer. You see, Jesus says, whatever that thing is, your treasure is found in. Put it aside and set your attention on me. Part two is, then come, follow me. Right, number one, set it aside, then come, follow me. Be in relationship with me. I think this is so cool here. Like, well played. Jesus, well played. You see, because this man asks Jesus for boxes to check, and Jesus responds with a relationship. I think you guys missed that. That's like kind of a big deal. This man says, Jesus, give me a list. Give me things I can do to inherit heaven. And Jesus turns it on a 180 and says, nah, it's bigger than that. Follow me. Have a relationship with me. Love me. And then... You're in. A relationship, and you're in. Easy, simple, right? A relationship, and you're in. But is it actually that easy? Continuing verses 24 through 27, Jesus looked at this guy and said, How hard is it for the rich to enter the kingdom of God? Indeed, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. Those who heard this asked, who then can be saved? Jesus replied, what is impossible with man is possible with God. Super famous few verses here, right? Jesus is saying, listen, following me, this whole Jesus thing is not easy. It was never supposed to be easy. We see that here. We see it in a bunch of other places in Scripture. Following him was never supposed to be easy. Right? We can all attest to that, right? We feel that, especially today. 
all the distractions and things in our world that are pulling us away from Jesus, we feel that. Right? It's real. It is hard to follow Jesus. It was never supposed to be a cakewalk. Right? And just, just for a second, to, to make this really real, just put whatever that thing is for you in these verses. How hard is it for the rich? How hard is it for the success-driven, for the calendar fillers to enter the kingdom of God? It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle. I mean, that's tough. That's hard to hear a little bit. I mean, our treasure, right? The thing that defines us, the thing we find our value in. We're supposed to set it aside and gaze our attention on Jesus? I mean, I can't do that on my own. How does he expect us to do that? And Jesus finishes by saying, I don't expect you to do it alone. Do it with me. And our, our, our students in our student ministry are probably tired of hearing me say this thing I'm about to tell you guys, but I, I think it's worth repeating that this whole Jesus thing boils down to relationships. I say it all the time to our students, this whole Jesus thing boils down to relationships. Love God, love people. Right? All of the Ten Commandments fall under one of those two things, loving God or loving people Jesus says, have this relationship with me. As a result of this relationship, that means we're going to end up loving people. Right? This whole Jesus thing boils down to relationships. Love God, love people. Which again, is a little bit of a theme that we've seen today. This is yet again one of those things that is a little bit easier said than done. It's harder than it looks, right? Being in relationship, loving people the way Jesus wants us to. All the time, I feel like, we're like, all right, Jesus wants me to love him. Okay, cool, I'll love you, Jesus. And in fact, Jesus, you asked me to love others, I will love most people too. I'll, I'll do those, but those few, can I just leave them back here? Can I not love them? Can I not do that thing? Right, you all know who I'm talking about. Jesus, I'll love you and everybody else as long as I don't have to love that one person at work who's just a little bit meaner to me than everyone else. I'll love you and everyone else as long as I don't have to go forgive that person that stabbed me in the back that one time. Jesus, I'll love you and I'll have a relationship with everyone except for that one person that's just a little bit weirder than the rest of my friends that may bring down my social status if I walk around with them. Right? It's a lot easier said than done. We're scared of some things that relationships bring. We're scared of the repercussions that could come from these things. Right? When Jesus, we feel this tug on our heart from Jesus to go love someone all the time, we're like, I don't know. And then we start to play out these scenarios in our head of how it could go and, and what could happen afterwards. We try to make this plan for ourselves on how it's going to work. And if we don't see a 100% chance of success... All the time we're like, all right, never mind, I'm out. I'm not loving that person. I don't want any part of it. Right? All the time we get scared of these things. We get scared of what may happen. We get scared of what people may think of us, the way they might view us. We get scared of the scars that we may attain from getting hung out to dry or humiliated for loving someone that's hard to love. But church, last time I checked... There's this dude named Jesus who is absolutely loaded with scars because of a relationship he wanted with us. So why are we so slow to return the favor and love people the way we have been loved? It's because our treasure is found in everything but relationships. Right? Our treasure is found in everything but we want to do our own thing. We want to follow our plan. We want to do it our way. And our treasure is found in everything but relationships so we can find it in ourselves. It makes me think, we have a student in our ministry right now who over the last couple months has begun to realize, hey, the biggest thing in my life is that I want to be in control. I want to know what's happening. I like being in control of every situation around me. And this student has been talking to me, has been talking to her small group leaders and we've been working through this, and she's begun to realize, I need to give up my control and give it to Jesus. 
right? When I let go of control, everything's going to be easier. But again, it's one of those hard things. So we've been working through this. And a couple weeks ago, I, I come home from the office. I come home from a day of work. And I walk in my house, and the student's just chilling on my living room floor. Like, apparently she just wanted to go hang out with my wife, because why wait for me to get home? She's, my wife's cooler than me anyways. So, right, she was there hanging out, and apparently, before I got there, my wife grabs a book off of our bookshelf and says, hey, you should read this. I think it'd be good for you. So she begins reading, and last week, I couldn't even tell you what book she handed her, and last week, this student texted me a quote from the book and said, hey, I think this applies to my life a little bit. And this quote says, we can stop waiting for a plan and just go love everybody. What if we just did that? What if we stopped waiting for a plan? What if we got out of our own heads and just loved people the way Jesus did? What if we valued relationship? What if we made our treasure in relationship? The story finishes in Luke chapter 18. Jesus says, truly I tell you, no one who has left home or wife or brothers or sisters or parents or children for the sake of the kingdom of God will fail to receive many times as much in this age and in the age to come eternal life. Jesus says here, if we're willing to give it up, if we're willing to put our treasure in him, in this relationship, everything else will work out. If we're willing to put our treasure in Jesus, everything else will work out. Which, by the way, can I just hit this point really quick? If, if we're really committed to this whole Jesus thing, and we really want these relationships to work out, and we want to foster this, and we want to see Jesus continue on for a long time, and lots of people to come to know Jesus, we should probably be a little bit more intentional about loving on and sharing Jesus with the generation that's growing up today? Because, church, you see, this generation that is growing up today, the students that I am lucky enough to get to hang out with every week, they are more capable than any generation in human history when it comes to telling people about Jesus. There is not a single thing you can convince me of more in this entire world than student ministry and the impact that this generation can have for Jesus beyond anything we've ever seen before. Right? We believe this so much. Uh, uh, about a month ago, we took a handful, a ton of middle schoolers to, to their week of camp, teaching them how to be kingdom workers and share Jesus with people. In two weeks from now, we're taking nearly 100 high schoolers, which if you want to pray for that, I'm leading a trip of 100 high schoolers. So <laughs> we're leading them on this trip to Tennessee for their week of camp because we believe in what they can do. And we believe in making sure they know how to be kingdom workers and spread the good news of Jesus. So if you know a high schooler who's not on this trip yet, or if you are a high schooler, we'd love to have you join us. But these students, right? They know more than any generation that has ever come before them. These students and these kids, they have access to more resources than any generation that has ever come before them. They, they love people and care about people more than any generation that has ever come before them. They're more aware of their surroundings than any generation that has ever come before them. All of this is in their favor when it comes to telling people about Jesus but it goes hand in hand with the fact that all of those same things make them the hardest generation to reach in human history. Right? They're the most capable once we get them there, but we got to get them on the boat first. And they are the hardest ones. We have to make a more conscious effort than ever when it comes to telling our kids and our students about Jesus. Because if we don't, if we don't pour into them and we don't make sure their treasure is in this relationship with Jesus, we're going to unfortunately see the number of people following Jesus start spiraling downward in a hurry. Right, so as we close talking about relationships and, and, and finding our treasure in Jesus, I want to tell you about these things called love languages. I don't know if you've heard of them. Some of you may have. There's tons of books and things that are written about them. I'm not going to go into all that. Hopefully this short graphic will help you out. The first, there's five of them. The first of the five love languages is words of affirmation. 
You feel loved and you feel cared for when someone speaks highly of you, when they tell you positive, encouraging things. For some people, that means, hey, that taco you made was absolutely delicious. Right? Love language number two is acts of service. People feel loved and cared for when you do something for them, when you use your skills to go out of the way and love them that way. That's the way they feel the most loved. Hey, you know what? I made you this taco. Love language number three is gifts. When you feel loved when someone uses their uh, money and their resources to get you something, that means when you and your family go out to salsas after church, like, hey, you know what? I love you so much, you get that extra taco today. I love you. Love language number four is quality time. This is where I fall. I feel the most loved when people spend time and take time out of their calendars to hang out with me. I, I appreciate that a lot. For some, they feel the most loved. And you're like, hey, you want to go grab tacos later? <laughs> Lastly, the fifth love language is physical touch. You feel the most loved with the warm embrace of another human, oftentimes just being hugged so tight that you're folded up straight up like a taco. Right? Those are the five love languages. Sometimes there's like a sixth special one. You just feel loved by just straight up tacos, period. Um, just kidding. Totally kidding. That one doesn't exist. But seriously, these five love languages exist so that we can show people love. They exist as their own language, a form of communication for us to say, hey, I love you. I care about you. This relationship means something. Right? These love languages exist so we can show people love, but oftentimes we fail at that too. We struggle to really tell people we love them and to share with them how much this relationship with them means. We fail at that sometimes, but there's this guy named Jesus who exclusively speaks the language of love. Jesus loves us so much and cares for us so deeply that there is nothing he can do except for express how much he loves us. There is nothing he can do except for share his love with us and tell us how much he loves us. Jesus doesn't care where you've come from. He doesn't care where you've been, what you've done. Jesus doesn't care what you look like, the things you've said. He doesn't care about any of that. None of that means a thing to him. Jesus just wants you. Jesus wants the real you, a relationship with you. So as we're finding our treasure in the right places, we continue to look at this guy that we see in Luke chapter 18. As his story comes to a close, us as the reader, we're left with a little bit of a cliffhanger. We don't really know how his story finishes. His story really finishes with a question mark, right? We as the reader are left to assume what he decides. Does this guy leave everything behind and chase Jesus and pursue this relationship? Or is that too hard for him and he doesn't, he, he doesn't fully grasp it and he's like, oh, I'm just going to hold on to this stuff even tighter than I ever have before. His story finishes with a question mark. And church, I can't confidently stand here and tell you what he chooses. But what I can confidently stand here and tell you is that your story does not have to end with a question mark. Your story doesn't have to end with a question mark. Don't miss what Jesus is calling you to. For some of us, that may be a relationship with him for the first time. We've never tried this whole Jesus thing out. We don't know what it's like. So maybe Jesus is calling us to that relationship for the very first time. Maybe we've done it before and, and we're kind of steering away now. We, we've loved Jesus and we've done the relationship and then it got hard and we ran away. Maybe Jesus is calling us back. For some of us, Jesus may be calling us to, to finally understand that that there are people in this world, there are people we interact with every single day who don't know Jesus and honestly don't want any part of knowing Jesus. And the way that we live our lives, the way we act, may be the only Bible they ever read. Church, I don't know what Jesus is calling you to, 
but I do know I don't want you to miss it. We talked about this flip of the page from Jude to Revelation, right? We talked about how we flip over this page of, of our own lives, and, and there's so much here, and we carelessly fly over it. You know, it's funny how Jude finishes with this final like challenge, almost even a warning of like, remember, don't miss it. Don't forget. Love Jesus. Tell people about him. And then early in Revelation, we see it says, you've forsaken your first love. For, for some reason, on this turn of the page, this unknown period of time that we live in today, we didn't keep the main thing, the main thing, the biggest deal, loving Jesus, being in this relationship, we missed it. But you know what? Through this turn of the page, through humanity missing it for so long, through all the wars and the heartache, what I find most promising is that, like we said in the beginning, from cover to cover, all of this, Jesus is there. He takes part in all of it. Jesus' hand is in all of this. And that turn of the page is no exception. This turn of the page that we currently sit in today, Jesus is still there. Jesus is still working. And Jesus still wants a relationship with you. And Jesus still wants a relationship with you. In Luke 18, we see this guy who for so much of his life just missed it. This Jesus relationship was not the biggest thing in his life. He missed it. He found his treasure in the wrong places. On this turn of the page from Jude to Revelation, we see so much of humanity finding their treasure in all the wrong things. They missed out on the relationship with Jesus. And church, make sure you don't miss it too. Thank you so much for being here with us today. We hope the message you just listened to had an impact on you. Make sure to stay connected with us throughout the week online at creeksidechristian.com and on Facebook and Instagram at Creekside Christian Church. We believe God has something unique to say to you, and our hope is that you feel His love stronger today than ever before. We love you, and we'll see you next time.